All right, it's Sunday, and today is usually the day where I put up our videos of what we've done for the week, our big exciting adventures that we take from our trading profits. But this week, our whole family wound up sick, and even though I had a decent week trading, we were just all too petered out and feeling miserable to do anything. So we all just sat around here and made some chicken noodle soup, watched some movies, and one of the movies we watched was one of our favorites. It's the, uh, the classic Stand By Me. I was like 15 or 16, I think, when that movie came out, and that movie which just always really stuck with me. And every time we get a chance to go see it, we, uh, you know, the, sometimes the theaters down here in LA play play old movies like that. Every time we get a, a chance to see it, we go out to take the family out and cover their ears during the bad word scenes. Anyway, we love that movie. And so we, we put that on this weekend and we watched it. And it, it reminded me of a couple years back when, when I started this whole thing where we make little movies of our family adventures from our trading profits. And uh, two years, uh, was it was about two years ago, I think, we did a road trip. Our whole family climbed into an RV and we did a road trip across the country where we traded all along the way. I taught my kids how to trade. We made a bunch of videos and um, I'll put those up here on this YouTube channel too. There's like five or six of them. But on the way back, on the last leg of the trip, we were driving down through Oregon and we passed the town where they made the movie Stand By Me. And so we decided to, you know, get off the highway, go in there and check it out. And we made this video. So this weekend we'll do a, a, what I'll call a classic rewind, kind of a, a flashback. One of the first videos that we did where we'd go out and videotape our trading profit adventures. So I'm just gonna let this play. It's maybe like 20 minutes long, but if there's any other Stand By Me fans out there like me, I think you'll dig it. All right, here it is. All right, so in this video, we're gonna take a look at our Stand By Me trip. We were all on a road trip going through Oregon. And as we were heading down towards California, we saw that we were gonna pass the little town of Brownsville, Oregon, which is the little town where they filmed that movie Stand By Me. And being huge Stand By Me fans, I mean, I've probably seen that movie uh, maybe close to 100 times. I, mean, I, can, I can recite all the lines from the scenes. It's one of my wife's favorite movies. We've shown it to our kids. So we had to stop to check it out and see the town where they filmed it and see if we could see the different locations where they filmed all the different scenes. So here we are heading into the town of Brownsville. And to get into the town, you have to go over that green bridge, that iconic green Stand By Me bridge, where the boys cross at the very end of the movie as they're coming back into town. And then once we got over that bridge, we'd go right into town, and we pulled over, we got out, and we just sort of started wandering around the town there. It's this little tiny, cool little town. And we just started wandering around, trying to see if we could find the different locations. And as we were doing that, this guy suddenly just appeared out of nowhere, just out of thin air. And he asked us if we were there to see the Stand By Me locations. And we said, yeah. And so then he asked if we wanted to take the dime tour, which I didn't know what that meant, but I guess what he meant was like uh, the short version of the Stand By Me tour. And at first we were a little bit hesitant because I mean, we were in a strange town. We didn't know this guy, he just kind of appeared out of nowhere. And you know, I could just see that it's on the news the next day, this family winds up dead in an alleyway of Stand By Me town. But we decided to go ahead and go with it. And he turned out to be this really cool guy who lives there. And he actually, there's every year towards the end of the summer, I guess this town, Brownsville, holds a Stand By Me Day where all the fans come into the town and, and they do things like they have a pie eating contest and they give tours of all the different locations from all the scenes. And this guy is one of the guys who gives those tours. So he knew the whole spiel. He knew all the different locations, told us a bunch of cool stories. And it just turned out to be a really, really cool day. So as he was taking us around, I pulled out my phone and I was just filming a lot of it. And so I'm just going to go ahead and let this video play and I'll, I'll intercut it with like the different scenes when we get to the different locations where they're filmed at. And, you know, it's like maybe 15, 20 minutes. So you don't have to sit through the whole thing if you don't want. But for any other Stand By Me fans like me, I think you'll find this really cool. So I'm just going to go ahead and let it play. So uh, this story here is the... Uh, now a Medicaid Lamb Valley Insurance Services. This was the five and dime store uh, at the beginning of the movie where um, you know Gordy goes in, he plunks down his his uh, dime or 20 cents or whatever for a comic book. It happened in the summer of 1959, a long time ago, but only if you measure it in terms of years. I was living in a small town in Oregon called Castle Rock. And he walks out of here and there's a, there's an old fashioned mailbox, you know, the drop box, mm -hmm. red and blue, right there. And where that white freight liner is parked on standby me day, usually the day before, the day of, and the day after, um, one of my neighbors, I, I live kind of up in the hills up by the standby me oak tree. And if you're interested later on after the short tour, I can point that out to you and you can check it out on your own. But I live uh, a block from the Stand By Me oak tree where the uh, 
where the four boys had their treehouse. Well, at the end of School Avenue, um, there's a, a gate and then it becomes rural property. And I have a neighbor that lives up there that has the brown Ford pickup. It was parked right where that oh, wow. was. And he still, he still has it. It was used in the movie. And he's got a little placard that he puts in the dashboard on nice. standby me days. And he'll, he'll park in that spot, you know, the day before, day of, and day after. I was living in a small town in Oregon called Castle Rock. There were only 1,281 people, but to me, it was the whole world. Hey, it's the boss man, Bob Cormier, here. It's a beautiful Friday morning in Portland. It's 90 KLAM degrees and getting hotter. Up the ladder with another platter. It's Bobby Day with Rock and Robin. It's Bob. the cost now. Um, you can see, of course, Gordy, you know, looks like an old car, 50s car path through the big day walks across the intersection. Were you here when they filmed it? I was, uh, I was stationed at Long Beach Naval Station at the time it was filmed, but my parents lived 30 minutes from here, and they filmed it in uh, 1985. It took them a year to edit the film. Um, well, it wasn't the editing that took so long, it was trying to find a distributor. Um, Rob Reiner couldn't find anybody to distribute the film the first six, seven months, and it was almost a bust. It was almost like it was gonna be shelved. And then uh, somebody came to the rescue in front of the money to do the distribution, the co cover the cost of distribution. Um, and it debuted in about August of 1986. I saw trailers for it um, on the TV down in Southern California, but I had heard all about it the year before from my family because it was, uh, it was quite to do. The fact that Hollywood come to a little town of Brownsville in Oregon, you know, so far removed from Hollywood right. and film a movie, which nobody really knew what the outcome was gonna be, right. uh, was big news here right. for, for the locals. Um, and, uh, you know, there were skeptics. There were some people that didn't like having Hollywood here and Rob Reiner because he, clo he closed the street for sometimes a week at a time to get all the shots done, you know, where uh, Ace comes out. Ace and, uh, and uh, um, that's uh, Chris's older brother. I want to say Billy, but it's not Billy. Um, Eyeball, Eyeball Chambers. You know, Ace and Eyeball. Ace, of course, is played by um, Keeper Sutherland. They come out of the tavern, and that's where they snag Gordon's hat his ball cap. And so that scene... It took them several takes to get that scene done there. Hey, girls, where are you going? Hey, come on, man. My brother gave me that. And now you're giving it to me. Give it to me! Come, come on, man! That's mine! You real asshole, you know that? Ooh. Your brother's not very polite, eyeball. Now, Christopher, I know you didn't mean to insult my friend. I know he didn't mean to insult me. That's why I'm going to give him the opportunity of taking it back. Oh, oh shit. Take it back. Oh, Come on, man. Stop it. You're hurting him. Bastard. Let go, man. Stop it, man. Take shit. It back, Cut it out. Kid. Oh. Oh. Cut it take out. It back. You'll be... Okay, okay. I take it back. I take it back. There. I feel a whole lot better about this. How about you? See you later, girls. Come on, just forget him. There's like six scenes, including the one that we just walked through. Uh, total six to eight scenes that happened on Main Street here in Brownsville. So he had to close the street down, reroute traffic. And a lot of locals didn't like that because it was hurting their business. And right, right. And now some of those same business owners are happy because now Standby Me Day brings yep. tourists from all over the world here. Yep. We yeah. wouldn't have known of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so Gordy comes walking down here. Um, you guys don't have any mobility issues as far as hiking, climbing? No, uh -uh. no major grass allergies because if you want it, can take you to the tree. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Okay. Cool, so cool. So we'll just we'll walk it like I normally do, like the tour. Um, most people have it electronic digitally, like Netflix or something. But if you pause the movie as Gordy's walking down and look at the storefronts, uh, the fitness center was a um, it was like a uh, yarn or quilting a quilting shop. Uh, so we actually have a, a, a real quilting shop right here. It's been here forever. There's also a yarn shop on the corner. 
But if you look at the signs, you'll see that the little uh, cupola there is still the same. You know, I mean, he's fixed right. it up, the owner's fixed it up and repainted it, but that's still, pretty much everything on the street front is, is the same. That is, it has been since 1919. Uh, and if you walk around town and have time to come back and spend more time, and you really walk the town and look closely, you'll see those brown wooden plaques with uh, cream colored uh, year, years. Uh -huh. And that tells the original owner of the building when it was built. This sign here was a coin operated laundry, which is what it really was. Uh, in, in a long 19, time ago. Yeah, back in 1985. Oh, okay. And it's still it's still hanging there. I mean, it's been painted over, but if you look really hard, you could probably see the first coin. And coin the butterflies, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it's just a third name on it. My house is mine hidden behind those trees there up on the hill. But I would, uh, I mean, right after we moved here, I started shortcutting down to the post office. The post office is that building there in front of the hardware store there on the corner. That's their loading dock for the post office. So rather than walk all the way down the street, I would shortcut through the field where the tree was. And I didn't even think about the tree um, until third time that I was shortcutting through there and that tree caught my attention. And I thought, I've seen this tree somewhere before. <laughs> um, and I'm going to come back to that story. But let me get back to me shortcutting through. I saw scraps of lumber and stuff that were used in the treehouse and just kind of scattered about. So, you know, local kids had probably disassembled it, reassembled it, who knows how many times over the years. So it was built for the film? It was built specifically for the film. My knowledge from local, what local cell made is they left that and they did not disassemble, they left it. Of course, you know, then the local kids would have enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, what the boys would have seen is, as they would walk up this trail to their, to their fort. Hey, how about the bears? <laughs> KLAM degrees and getting hotter. Up the ladder with another platter. It's Bobby Day with Rock and Robin. It's Boss. Here, if you look right through the branches of, uh, of this large oak tree, you can see where we were. Uh, we were, well, it's, see the Brownsville Tavern has like the dark brown facade. Next to it is the Brownsville Pharmacy, and then the red building is part of the pharmacy. And the next one over was the one where they had the five and bound shop. Now, as we move across the street, coming this way towards us, you'll see the U.S. Post Office, and you can see a postal vehicle there in the back. And the loading dock that we saw, uh, the, the tall second story roof that slants back this way, that's the hardware store. It's been a hardware store since 1903. Great. Um, I just love how nothing's changed. Looks like they put effort into keeping things. Well, there's, there's a historic review board that has to review submissions of permits for the area encompassed by these hillsides known as Old Town Commercial. And the theory is if you want to build something new or renovate, you have to stay within the period of between about 1880 and 1950. Mm -hmm. So they give you like a seven year span of when you can uh, you know, make what your facade or like. make it look like, yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, on the way down, you'll, I'll show you a building that had to comply with the historic review board. It's a new building built just a few years ago and you can see that they've done that. You see turkey feathers in yeah, the mountain. Yeah, I know. But, when you get right about here, where the stone is, it should come into full recognition. Yeah. The large limb that is going off at a, at a 90 degree angle there, that's the limb where the boys have to creep for. And they had a pole that was like the beam was the beam was just one beam, a pole that rested right in that little uh, that little crack or that little curve. And the, the pole came out this way towards us with a big rope that went up to an upper limb and it was tied off. And then that pole beam supported the floor and the whole uh, treehouse structure. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, something I share with Stand By Me fans when I'm doing the walking tours is, is a little known fact, and I only discovered this later, you know, looking through, doing some research. Rob Reiner, the director, had his, um, he had his crew set up a, a, a mock-up of the same treehouse that his carpenters built in the tree, a mock-up one minus the roof, and minus a, uh, like one side 
so that they could position the cameras. And they set that up on, on scaffolding. Scaffolding was raised to the same height as that limb there, and that was set right just beyond where that large stone is, between that large stone and the oak trees there. Hmm. Now they did that and they had like a catwalk that went all the way around so they could position those huge lights that shine down so they get the lighting crew could do their job. And then the, the booms and gaffers and all those people that hold the mics and everything could do their job and stand up there. And then one wall, wall removed uh, so they could get the camera angle of the boys playing cards. Remember there's three of them. And uh, before the fourth one joined them. And you wouldn't know that if you were to stop and pause the video between the outside shots of the treehouse where Gordy climbs up and joins, you know, Chris and Teddy, who mm -hmm. are already playing cards inside, and the in or the inside ones and the outside ones, you wouldn't know that because the backdrop, you know, looking through as the camera looks in through the through the treehouse and the and the window screen or the window uh, drapery or like it's kind of partially open and you look behind, you see the red buildings, and if you look beyond there, you see the bridge that came across the famous mm -hmm. standby new bridge. The angle is, is 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 it's indetectable to the human eye, so you don't know what which scene was shot on the scaffold and what was shot from outside. They made their own little sound stage. Yeah, so they made their own little sound stage just just right over there, and not everybody knows that. Of course, it's spoiled a little bit now. When they built this house in 1996, the the this back part of the house kind of would obstruct the view. If they would if they were to put the scaffolding back the way it was uh, for the filming you know that house would now block some of the view would be the obvious and waves come by and then as he turns around to walk he disappears and that's when um uh, who's the actor that does Dreyfus. the adult or richard, richard Dreyfus. Dreyfus, thank yeah. you. richard Dreyfus is now doing the adult narration of i never had any friends like i did when i was 11. and um you know and also that narration which starts the movie and ends the movie he's reading about his friend from high or from junior high days who always made the best piece and tried to break up a fight in a restaurant and got stabbed in the throat. He and got me up here. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, so huge fans of River Phoenix, the young actor who was up and coming, get real emotional about that because, I mean, they're standing right here where River Phoenix playing uh, Chris Chambers, you know, was in the treehouse, walks there, disappears. That's right there where yeah. they walked off into. Where he, where he where, dissolved, yeah. he kind yeah. of disappeared? Yeah, that little, kind of like a little path that we uh, made as we walked right up, he disappears right off the way. Oh. Yeah. I'm never gonna get out of this town, am I, Gory? You can do anything you want, man. Yeah. Sure. some skin. I'll see you. Not if I see you first. Chris did get out. He enrolled in the college courses with me, and although it was hard, he gutted it out like he always did. He went on to college and eventually became a lawyer. Last week, he entered a fast food restaurant. Just ahead of him, two men got into an argument. One of them pulled a knife. Chris, who had always made the best piece, tried to break it up. He was stabbed in the throat. He died almost instantly. Okay, so from here, that big white house there, which is a historical house, that's where we went up the hill, the back way to the treehouse location, and of course we came down. The first Baptist, what used to be the first Baptist church, it's now a residence, is in the backdrop as Gordy and Chris go running down the alley after the waitress comes out of the group one dining. Gordy, get it! Gordy, let's get it! Now, there's a sign it's supposed to be a replica that says Blue Point Diner that's above the, the tavern storeroom. That's in the wrong location. It should actually be further down. It should be over. It should be about where it says Brownsville Pharmacy. They had a new sign made up that says Brownsville Pharmacy. It's kind of antique looking. Uh -huh. It's new. That's where the Blue Point Diner sign should have been. Now, I was corrected. We're going to come down the alley and show you the gun scene. I was corrected uh, on that by... Um, I got corrected uh, about 
six years ago, seven years ago. I was in the early stages of leading tours. And, so, and uh, some Japanese tourists who came all the way from Japan, it was like three young lady, yeah, three young ladies, super fans, they made the trip special here because they, they wanted to get pictures of all the filming scenes. And they had the movie queued up on a, on like an iPad or something. And I tried to tell them that, the, I tried to tell them that this is where the waitress comes out, where the sign says blue point, oh, yeah. but that's wrong. Cool. Um, the prior owner of the saloon had that uh, fake uh, door painted like that to drum up more business for the, the saloon tavern Sneaky. restaurant. Yeah, but the Japanese uh, uh, fans, one of them walked further down and found the actual location and corrected me. And thankfully, because you know otherwise I'd be pointing people in the wrong direction. This is where Chris and Gloria had the genesis. And there were a couple of trash cans right there on the corner, those old style 1950s metal trash cans right there, one with a lid on and some trash. There's a couple of pallets that stack up along the side here. And where the green colored bricks are, those were windows. And then the blue coin diner door where the waitress comes out was actually where that steel door is now. And of course, uh, you know, Chris pulls out of his bedroll, you know, the pistol. And shows it to Gordy, and of course, you know, Gordy's like, Is it loaded? Hell no, you think that's stupid? And of course, he squeezes off around there, not knowing that it was, it was chained yeah, to the one in the tree. Yeah. So that scene is there. And so, on standby me day, we have a lot of fun when we lead the tours. I have a couple of replica trash cans that I'll set up the morning of, early in the morning, and set up, we'll set up the uh, pallets just like they were in the movie that's great and then we make this one of the stops on the walking tour and we let people get you know pictures and selfies fun that's great come on man what is it come on what is it you want to be the lone ranger or the cisco kid walking talking jesus Where'd you get this? Hocked it from my old man's bureau. It's 45. I can see that. <clears throat> you got shells for it? Yeah. I took all that was left in the box. My dad'll think that he used them himself shooting at beer cans while he was drunk. <clears throat> Is it loaded? Hell no. What do you think I am? <clears throat> Jesus! Let's get out of here! Come on! <laughs> Hey, who did that? Who's letting cherry bombs off out here? The first rain came and went, the second rain came and went, the third rain came and went, and it is now a permanent fixture. So that's the original Coca-Cola? It's the original Coca-Cola mural painted uh, uh, as part of the set. Wow. So that's one of the few things that still remains that was, um, you know, made specifically for the set. But you guys now go back and... Keep there's there's a local group of artists that have been committed to uh, faithfully freshing it up from time to time, and they've done at least one freshen up in the 30 years since the movie was filmed. That's great. And they've 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 you know they've been very meticulous to make sure that they don't alter it or change it or anything, and they've put their initials down at the bottom. And it has a year. You can go down later and get a picture. Yeah. Good for and them. Uh, you can see the names of the artists that, that just freshened it up a little bit because it was getting faded, pretty faded out. Right. As time went on, we saw less and less of Teddy and Vern, until eventually they became just two more faces in the halls. It happens sometimes. Friends come in and out of your life like busboys in a restaurant. We stopped here to say their goodbyes. Uh, I think the first one, I get mixed up because I gotta watch the film again. I think the first one to say goodbye is Teddy. And he says, well, I guess I better get home before my mom puts me on the most wanted list. The most wanted <laughs> list. And that's Teddy's house right there. Oh, oh wow. yeah. That's totally it. And then Vern, I think, is the next to say, well, I guess I'll see you guys in school. In school. And either Chris or Gordy say, yep, see you in junior high. Or maybe, maybe, maybe Vern says, yeah, see you in junior high. And then Vern walks across the street. And halfway down there, if you look in the zebra stripe, the middle one, uh -huh. towards the, this end, the south end, 
there's a penny embedded there. All right. Permanently you embedded. And you can do that later, but make sure okay. that you watch for traffic because okay. people will run you over. <laughs> so that's another scene. Perfect. Of course, he bends over, picks up the penny, turns around. Penny. So that's another scene. Um, and then, of course, that leaves Chris and Gordy. And they continue walking on. They walk down past the, you know, that, the, what's now the fitness center. It was the quilting shop back to the treehouse. in school. Yeah. Yeah. See you in junior high. Well, guys, I better get home before my mom puts me on ten most wanted list. <laughs> you, Chris? No hard feelings, okay? No way, man. Gun will probably is a part of a man. Zach, show us where Vern left his or picked up his penny at the end. It's a penny. Let's see. Look at that. They embedded a penny into the walk. And so that was pretty much it. The, the guy went home and we kind of walked back into town, looked around and then right before we took off and headed back out of town, we all went back there behind the diner where the gun scene was and we did our own reenactment of it. Standing right here. I'll this is Chris and, and the gig party. This is the VP of the first assistant the director. Gonna be shooting. So this is where um, they shot the gun off, right? There used to be a window there. I forget what your line. But then you're gonna shoot it. You're surprised that it goes off because you don't think there's a there's a can you don't I think know, there's like, a Jesus. yeah you go like this both of you at the same time Jesus and then you go running off this way and then the waitress comes out okay ready and action Jesus who's putting off cherry bombs. <laughs>